Hello, this is a taped program of the Gay Liberation Network. I'm Bob Schwartz, sitting next to me is the co-founder of Gay Liberation Network, Andy Thayer. Tonight we're going to be talking about election absurdities. So, I'm not Chris Matthews, this is not the place for politics, uh, uh, this is not cable TV uh, or a network broadcast where you, if you tune in uh, at this time, you're going to catch wall-to-wall 24-7 -wall, uh, coverage of uh, what we would like to suggest uh, is essentially a charade uh, to uh, prevent uh, fundamental change from occurring uh, in our society. So that's why we're going to speak with you today about uh, election absurdities. The horse race, uh, the, the, uh, the coverage of the, of the uh, front runners, uh, it's all calculated to keep your attention uh, on something that is guaranteed to uh, uh, keep the status quo in place and uh, to prevent any fundamental change from taking place. So, Andy and I are going to be uh, talking about election absurdities. I've already sort of kicked it off. So what? Well, what's your comment, Andy? Well, I think the main thing that people need to keep in mind this election season is not who said what to whom or whatever on whatever show, whatever gaffe he or she said, um, but really. The, the issue should be about how do we get the kind of change that the politicians pretend to deliver but never do. I mean, and I think you can see the contrast between how change is really made versus the election absurdities in the history of our own town over the last six months. I have lived in this town for well over 30 years, and we've had innumerable elections, and count countless millions of dollars, uh, thousands upon thousands of activist hours wasted figuring out who is going to rule over us for the next several years. And it really hasn't changed a hell, hell of a lot for the most part. Um, there's been some changes around the edges. It's not like every candidate is the same as everyone else. Yes, there are differences. It's, it's, it's frankly a straw figure to say there's zero difference between different candidates. People in our position never say that. Uh, it's really a question of how do you get the kind of sweeping change that working class people, that people who are oppressed due to their race or their uh, gender or their sexual orientation or gender identity, how do we get these kind of changes that the candidates constantly promise but never deliver? And well, I, I just wanted to uh, give one example of, of the kind of direct action that I think you're talking about. Several weeks ago, uh, Andy and I both participated in a protest march um, that was organized by the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, thousands of people on the streets of Chicago. The public school system is under attack by politicians of both parties, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Rauner and Rahm Emanuel are, are both calling for cutbacks. Uh, and the teachers and the students uh, to do with less. So we were out there participating in this massive protest. That's mm -hmm. the kind of direct action that, that, that we think can deliver the goods in, uh, in terms of uh, fundamental change in this society. Uh, we need to uh, uh, have less focus on the ballot box 
and more focus on taking protests to the street. Another example uh, was the, the, uh, the, the, the protests on North Michigan Avenue uh, on Black Friday, where the, the, the street was effectively shut down uh, and the business people lost a lot of money. And shortly after that, uh, Gary McCarthy, the police superintendent, was fired uh, just days after Emanuel said, I've got your back, uh, Gary. Mm -hmm. He was gone. And that, that was a result of, of, of direct action. Mm -hmm. And, and we've, had, we've seen this. That really, the face of politics in Chicago changed radically over a, 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 a course of a handful of months when people flooded into the streets day after day. And they've opened up the city to a whole new kind of politics that we haven't seen on a sustained level for literally several decades. I'm talking about people marching in the streets without permits, without getting permission from the authorities, and that's a good thing. I say this as someone who has helped get permits for any number of issues, whether we're talking about marches against the war, for gay rights, or what have you, that the fact that these protests around the Laquan McDonald police murder have opened up politics in this town so that the police are afraid to take certain actions against protesters, at least for the time being, is, is critical that uh, we have uh, many thousands of people, particularly the black youth, the Latino youth in this town, have opened up a space for people protesting, whether for union rights, whether against racial injustice, or whatever issue they happen to be, um, in a way that we haven't seen. Now, we have had any number of politicians who promised to have open administrations, transparency. I mean, Rahm himself did it in the run-up to his first election, and yet uh, we didn't get that. What's forced it has been uh, activist journalists such as uh, uh, Jamie Calvin, uh, uh, Freddie Martinez, uh, Brandon Smith, who have worked outside of the major structures, have gotten some attorneys to help them force open the records of the Chicago Police Department, force open the records of the uh, Independent review, uh, review, Police Review Authority and others, and it gave us, as a result, the Laquan McDonald police shooting video that uh, exposed the, 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 the rancid underbelly of a Rahm Emanuel administration. Um, it, it, and that's really what's changed the face of politics. It hasn't been this or that aldermanic election. It hasn't been Chewy Garcia versus Rahm uh, or other things. And, 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 and my big fear now is that we're seeing lots of, frankly, predominantly white leftist, leftists uh, getting all excited about the Bernie Sanders campaign, and at the end of the day, he's going to just shovel it over to Hillary, who is to the right of Barack Obama, and Barack Obama hasn't done the left any favors while he's been in office for two terms. Yeah, well, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, because there are a lot of people uh, who are excited about Sanders mm -hmm. because he, he's saying some things that, 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 uh, that need to be said. Um, the, the, uh, the attacks that he's made on the, uh, on the super rich uh, mm -hmm. uh, who clearly call the shots in, the, uh, uh, in this society. Um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that that uh, uh, he has struck a chord mm -hmm. uh, with with thousands of people uh, who are ready for a fundamental change in this society. But you're saying that 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 uh, Sanders isn't going to deliver that change. Now he can't. Why, even why are you he, saying that? He he could be Jesus Christ, and he could not uh, deliver it because, frankly. The kind of change that he is talking about that has got so many people excited can only come from below. It can only for, come from a mass movement that's not directed by this or that politician at the top, but is truly coming from below. I mean, people say, oh, well, this is totally different with Sanders. Well, we heard that same rhetoric come right. out of candidate Barack Obama back in the day. We've heard it out of any number of of, of candidates in the past before that. The point is is that there are there is astroturf grassroots and then there is truly 
directionless quote-unquote grassroots such as Occupy, such as the anti-war movement of the 1960s, such as the labor movement of the 1930s, despite the efforts of various individuals within those movements to control it. It's when, when those individuals started having that kind of control, that's when things began to go south in a, in a very bad way. Um, so uh, this notion that uh, come uh, November when uh, you know, Hillary is the, uh, the nominee, or I should say July, when Hillary is the nominee, that suddenly this movement is going to take on a life of its own, I think is, is the saddest of illusions. The, the track record of these movements to try to change the Democratic Party, and that's what's going on with the Sanders campaign, is trying to take over an institution which is fundamentally opposed to working class people, fundamentally opposed to the rights of the oppressed, and it's not going to work. And, and the tragedy is, is that we're going to see a lot of effort go to naught, and uh, the time to start saying that is right now, and not waiting until July when people get disappointed when uh, Hillary is crowned. Well, I think a fundamental task that, that needs to be carried out is, is to drive home the difference between a movement and an election campaign. The, the, the two are fundamentally, diametrically opposed uh, 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 to each other. Um, an election campaign is just that. I mean, it's focused on, on putting a, a person, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, putting a person in office uh, uh, to bring about change. To do it for us. To do it for us, uh, and uh, when in fact, uh, that, that's not going to happen. The Democratic Party, as Andy has said, it, uh, is not going to be reformed. Uh, it, uh, it's been correctly described as the graveyard of, uh, of, uh, of movements. Um, so. Fundamentally, it seems to me, we have a difference of, uh, uh, between a movement and an election campaign. And what we need is to build a movement. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, an election campaign really detracts from, from the movement building that, that is uh, so critically essential to bringing about fundamental change. Absolutely. And I, I think one of the easy ways to tell the difference between a movement and an election campaign, despite the pretenses of some election campaigns to be movements, is who controls the messaging? Um, who controls the voice of the movement, uh, if it is indeed a movement? With things like Occupy, with things like Black Lives Matter, it is individual activists on the ground working in small committees who to say, well, we're going we're gonna to organize this protest against this latest police shooting. We're going to do this march. We're not going to look for direction from uh, headquarters in D.C. or New York or Vermont or whatever. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to decide to emphasize this or that issue. Whereas you look at how election campaigns run, and, and I saw this very vividly with the um, uh, prospective candidacy of Karen Lewis when she was contemplating a run for mayor, went to uh, one of her uh, you know, listening sessions, and in, instead of it being really a listening section, it was more of a talking session <laughs> where we were told that the messaging was going to be directed from the top, period. And, and this is coming from Karen Lewis. This is about as, you know, grassroots, you know, a prospective candidate as you could hope for. Um, and, and that was the message from her, let alone someone like Bernie who has been in uh, D.C. politics for literally a decade and voted with the Democrats and been a, essentially a loyal Democrat uh, on any number of issues over the years. And it's very interesting in terms of the voting records of uh, Bernie and Hillary. Uh, the similarities are far more profound than the differences that while Bernie may make a big deal about Hillary's vote for the war, uh, the Iraq War I'm talking about here, and the Iraq invasion, and that was certainly an infamous vote, uh, that didn't prevent Bernie from himself voting for war funding for year after year after year. D you see um, the, the brutalities that are committed by the Saudi dictatorship, 
you see the brutalities uh, instituted by the Israeli state against the uh, Bantu stands uh, the, that are uh, the West Bank and uh, and uh, the Gaza Strip, and and, and literally um, there isn't a huge difference between the candidates. The rhetoric is different, but the votes for funding the billions of dollars to the Israeli regime, the billions of dollars of military hardware to the Saudi dictatorship currently carrying out a dirty war in Yemen, currently uh, 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 repressing its own people, whether you're talking about women, gays, Shias, uh, the recent uh, crushing of the democracy movement in Bahrain. These fundamentals of guaranteeing American power over the rest of the planet that's something that all candidates agree on. They may have differences about how to do it, but the notion that the peoples of the world, whether in Bahrain or whatever, should control their own destinies is utterly foreign uh, to all of the candidates. Well, and, and the, the issues that Andy has raised, um, the issues surrounding U U.S. foreign policy, you know, are, are, are never on, on the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, whether Wall Street should uh, call the shots uh, in terms of, of the United States economy, uh, how it's organized, uh, uh, who profits from it, those fundamental questions are never on a ballot. And uh, um, as Andy says, the candidates may have rhetorical differences. Uh, we certainly saw that with Obama, particularly uh, in 2008. You know, uh, uh, he was uh, promising transparency, hope, and change, and that he would be the candidate for the, uh, you know, the, the, the average man and woman. And then he gets in office and he represents what? The same interests of Wall Street. Right down to, to most of the same personnel when you look at who oh. he filled his cabinet with. The same personnel, yeah. And, and, and really you look at the Bush administration foreign policy towards the end of his term, uh, his second term I'm talking about here, and it was virtually indistinguishable from that of the Obama administration uh, foreign policy. The one different, major difference is we've seen a huge ramping up of the use of drones and the uh, resultant mess that we've seen where uh, Obama has now bombed more, almost twice as many countries as George W. did. And George <laughs> W. was certainly no friend of, of independence for the peoples of the Middle East or elsewhere. Well, uh, and Obama, uh, I think at this very moment, is in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, talking to... My, the, that must be awkward. Yeah, <laughs> talk, talk, <laughs> talking to the, uh, to the leadership there that, 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 that is as brutal yes. as ISIS. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they've carried out beheadings that, 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 that are, are comparable... Hundreds. Uh, comparable to the to the uh, to the atrocities of ISIS for crimes like sorcery for crimes like like sorcery uh, and uh, uh, and uh, for all kinds of petty offenses theft mm -hmm. and so on uh, uh, you can have your hands chopped off or mm -hmm. or, uh, or even be killed but of course these atrocities are uh, are never broadcast on network television unlike the atrocities of the official enemy of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. So uh, this certainly raises some questions about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what what is motivating uh, U.S. friendship toward uh, 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 dictatorships like uh, Saudi Arabia? Well, uh, it's it's could all. Could it be the oil? Well, I mean, and the the interesting thing is, that it's not even oil that the United States, for the most part, consumes, because most of the Middle Eastern oil actually doesn't go to the United States. It goes to places like China and Europe, and so it's really it's a geostrategic move to for the United States for over more than the last half century to control the Middle East by one means or another. It's because we get most of our oil from from friendly dictatorships or neo-dictatorships like Nigeria. Uh, and uh, so what it has, has been is let's have a lever of control over uh, the Europeans, 
our big economic rivals over the Chinese, and before that, them, the Japanese, big economic rivals. That was the reason for United States dominance. It's not that we imported much oil from, from many of the areas that the United States has been trying to control. Um, but where Bernie comes in, and where I think his uh, supporters need to stop being apologists, is that um, how can you talk about free tuition for higher education, forgiveness of student debts, free health care, free this or that, I mean, a real jobs program that the people, particularly minority youth, need. You can't talk about spending money on these things at the same time as you're talking about spending as much on the military as the rest of the world combined. And that's almost what the United States does right now. And uh, Bernie has not talked about dramatically cutting U.S. military spending so that he can support those things, let alone saying that the United States has got no business trying to control the destinies of the peoples of the Middle East or elsewhere in the world. So it's, it's, it's a real Achilles heel of the uh, uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. And, and, and what we're left with then is, is the lots of vague talk about revolution, which for those of us who are old enough sounds very reminiscent of hope and change. And we saw where that left us. <laughs> it left a, an anti-war movement that was flat on its back because it, most of the activists had put their, uh, their emphases on supporting uh, the Obama candidacy, only to have troops still, of course, in Iraq, troops still in Afghanistan. The latest Pentagon statements are that uh, troops are U.S. troops are going to be in Afghanistan indefinitely on the scale of Korea or Japan. Well, and more troops have just just been sent to Iraq. Right. Uh, and the the networks. Um, I noticed this the other evening. The networks were in competition to see who, who could interview the highest ranking U.S. official uh, to, uh, uh, to, to act as scribes uh, as these officials. Ashton Carter, the defense mm -hmm. secretary, Barack Obama, the president. Uh, the n networks acting as scribes as these officials laid down the, uh, uh, the reasons for the, uh, the increase in troops. Uh, and of course, this this violates the the promise of uh, of Obama that that we were getting out of Iraq, and exactly the opposite thing is happening, mm -hmm. uh, and the media is uh, is is, uh, is right there to uh, uh, to say, uh, yes, sir, of course, that's the way it should. Thank be. you for doing that. Um, and, and, and really their notion of quote-unquote getting out isn't really about getting out. It's let's drop bombs directed by people at bases in Arizona or in Bahrain. I'm talking about, of course, drone attacks. And uh, there have been several studies that have found that for every uh, quote-unquote bad guy that they claim to be targeting, there's 20 unknowns who are killed in each of these, people for whom they can't even uh, uh, come up with any kind of rationalization for killing. And, and frankly, if I was a relative of one of those killed, I would be very tempted to commit violence against whomever did it. And so really what these, let's pull out the troops on the ground and let's do this through drone attacks is doing it's creating more terrorists. It's creating the very kind of stability that then means you got to send in ground troops. And we're, we're seeing this in, uh, in, in, in a whole series of countries that have become basket cases um, as a result of, of these drone bombings, Yemen being the, the most egregious one. Um, we're seeing it in Somalia. We're seeing it in, in uh, uh, um, other areas of, of the region. So we got a mess on our hands, and it's really a question, are the peoples of the world, including in this country, going to fall for the kind of uh, uh, shell games that have not uh, led to true liberation, or are we going to look to our past, how we got things like Social Security 
something that all the politicians say they're about defending. How do we win Social Security in the first place? How did we win the eight-hour day? How did we win uh, prohibitions against racial discrimination, at least somewhat? Uh, it has been through the movements in the streets, whether you're talking about the 60s, whether you're talking about the 30s. It's when people did it for themselves. It's when we put our faith in the candidates, even when they're saying all the right things, even when they're totally virtuous. And there are, rarely, virtuous politicians out there that naively think that they're going to free the rest of us. And our message is, that's not the way that change happens. Yeah, when we think about politics, we need to uh, 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 think about building a movement uh, and not walking to, uh, to the ballot box. I mean, that, mm -hmm. th that's a fundamental uh, change in consciousness that I, I, I think needs, needs to occur. So uh, hopefully we've, we've made a, uh, a contribution to uh, what is uh, a very necessary uh, uh, discussion in pointing out the difference between elections uh, and movement building. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us.